All right, so today, building the computer with my nephews, my nephew Jimmy. See, I already did it, I leaned forward and you leaned back. Oh yeah. The focus problem. <laughs> so I'm building another one because Asus wanted me to work with their new, uh, this is their creator, ProArt creator motherboard, and I was interested in it too. So a lot of this stuff is provided by Asus. I don't think I bought much on this build. You know, normally I buy like half the parts. I think pretty much everything was provided to me, which is why I felt like I needed to do something. So the last one that I built, I'm giving to this guy because he needs a new computer, because when was the last time you built one? 2011? Yeah, so he needs a new computer, and I don't need extra computers, and because I got this stuff gifted to me, thank you to Asus. So is this the computer? Yeah, I would say, Jimmy, you're reasonably well-versed in computer stuff. Not like an expert, but you know, you built your own computer last time. Built my own computer. Um, I more or less understand what each component does, and But I, there's new stuff since then. New new ways to do my, things. I, know, I don't know anything about this stuff. So that's fun. So the computer we're building today, the one that I'm gonna be giving to Jimmy is a similar one, just using like slightly older parts. What do you use your computer for mostly these days? Basic productivity, like every uh, white underachieving 30 something, a little bit of Ableton Live, <laughs> a little bit of music, <laughs> a little bit of gaming. I dabble in the, in the gaming realm. Gerald and I used to game quite a bit, so. You know. I think you're gonna be gaming more. And I think the people watching this will be like, you better be gaming more with, uh, w with the computer build. Because uh, we work in 3090s around here. Because you know about the GPU shortage thing, right? It's, it's, it's leveling itself off mostly, but you said you saw the memes on Reddit. Oh, yeah. So there, there actually came a time where when you would source parts from uh, like Asus or whatever for the PR units, mm -hmm. it was easier to get the top line 3090 than it was to get like the medium high-end cards. So they just be like, we don't got those, we got a 3090. So all the builds I'm doing are on 3090s all the time, which is good for video editing. And, oh yeah, actually, and uh, a little bit of, I'm gonna be using it a little, for a little bit of Maya as well. A little bit of, you know, 3D. For what? Just personal projects, learning okay. new skills, you know? <laughs> so this is gonna be the feature piece, ProArt X570 Creator Wi-Fi. Now normally, you know, we go through this whole like, anti-static procedure, but, Recent videos have shown it's harder than you'd think. Ah! Ah! Okay, we're ah! So do we? We don't have the bracelet. We don't have the bracelet. I want the bracelet. We don't have the bracelet. And you can also, what I do sometimes is I hook up the power supply. This is an ROG Strix 1000 watt. Do you know what a Strix is? I don't. I think it is an owl. I think it is a some type of bird. If you play Magic <laughs> the Gathering, you'll know that that's. Is there like a card that's called a Strix yeah, and it's got exactly. an owl on it? Bail for Strix. Okay, what are you pointing at? There's no Magic the Gathering in there. Maybe there probably is, oh, actually. Yeah. So you can ground yourself like that. You gotta touch like a grounded part, like, you know. I have shoes on that have rubber soles. Yeah. Is that gonna matter at all? That's what I said, this is all moot. All right, so a little motherboard action there. I like the aesthetic. We've got a 2.5 and a 10 gig ethernet port built right in. And there's also, you can see extra USB-C ports, which are Thunderbolt 4 on this motherboard. And I think these are the first motherboards that have Thunderbolt 4 and running an AMD processor, a display port and an HDMI. And so you have to take your like graphics card out. That's that's why there's a display port in the motherboard box, a cable. So you can go from your graphics card out and then back into the motherboard so that you're taking your graphics card video and then putting it out through Thunderbolt. So for people who want to do everything over Thunderbolt, you yeah, have that. Allow it. We've got four 10 gig USB ports, obviously the USB-C type. And then there's two more, I think these are actually just five gig USB ports and then two more up there. So for me, that's plenty of connectivity. You can see it's really, really well built in terms of, I asked when they sent it, I was like, because it's like some creator board, is it gonna be you know, worse for VRMs or for cooling or something? I'm gonna sacrifice overclocking. Am I still gonna game on it the same way? And they said, yeah, like these boards are built to the same level as they're competing you know, almost like to like the ROG, you know, gaming boards, but these just have extra things like 10 gig NIC and Thunderbolt 4. Let's stick the CPU in there. So Asus sent along a Ryzen 9 5950X. The last build it was a 5900X. Just get a little side grip on it there. And then put the gold triangle at the little bo boobob there. And just kind of like line it up, but it sh no pushing should be required. It should almost fall into the hole, you know? When you say it, the CPU, all of the pins should the pins, fall exactly, right into the yeah. hole. There you go. All right, computer's built. Let's plug right. it in a game. What kind of drives were you using when you built your last computer? Uh, I had a 750 gigabyte Caviar Blue. Oh, like a spinning disk. disk drive. Yeah, okay. So NVMe drives are solid state, 
but they're crazy fast and they plug directly into the motherboard, almost like a graphics card. Oh, I should have mentioned this by the way, this one is one of the, I'm pretty sure it's a fanless design. So when X570 first came out, they, were, they had to have a fan cooling the chipset, but then they recently, like this year, moved to fanless designs. This is also fanless, so it's passively cooled. So is this the, this is the way that internal hard drives or drives are, are going? Is this, this connectivity? Yeah, I would say, I don't know what the numbers are, but I would say most new builds over the last like maybe year, like couple of years, the NVMe is the, that's your boot drive. Like Windows goes on that, that's, and you know, you probably load your best games on there and everything. And then some people still install spinning disks if they want t a ton of storage. Um, Got it. If you want, you know, we're talking dozen terabytes or something. Mm -hmm. If you only need a couple terabytes, I'd probably just do NVMe all the way through. These are from Seagate. These are Fire Cuda 520s. They're two terabytes. They're rated for five gigabits per se five thousand megabytes per second. And there's a dragon on the front. There you go. That's all you need. On this motherboard, there's like these little swirly things. Maybe the shot you can see that they basically lock them in by themselves. But once once that's kind of locked in, and then once we glue and screw this thing down, the oh, SSD that also goes down. Yeah. So I the, SS, like, the SSD is not going to go anywhere. But I'm used to screwing them down, and I'm not used to seeing these like swivel. Oh, is this four by eight? Each. Oh my gosh. Each, each, kit, each is yeah, what? Each kit. Each dim. Uh, is 32 gigabytes. I chose this RAM on the last build because it was really compatible and I liked it. Uh, it's kind of like a no frill, seems to work all the time and it's always in the list of like approved RAM and I liked it and it's not RGB and it's nothing fancy, you know. Um, this is DDR4, 3600 megahertz, CL16. So it's a good balance. There's kind of like a sweet spot going where you can go faster RAM, but then the timings are looser. But then you also have to overclock the RAM. Affinity fabric, the multiplier, parity, but then dual channel memory that- Got it. So we're gonna load them sticks in. So normally, there's a protocol for installing RAM, like you have to use certain mm -hmm. slots, but in this case, we're just gonna populate all of them. Because usually, does it still skip it? Like one, three, and then, or two, four? Exactly, yeah, two, two and four. Basically, usually it's the, you start farther away from the CPU, so you would do these two. Great. All right, same as last time though, this is the Fantex P600S, which I like. I like building in it, I like the way it looks. It's another silent case. Uh, I was really happy with my last build, so I'm doing it again. I've never installed a cooler cooling system. So let's do it. I didn't look up how to pronounce it correctly, but Ryujin? Ryujin? Ryujin. Ryujin. So this is a literal radiator. Yes, but it's AIO because the fluid, it's like its like enclosed in itself, right? It's a closed loop. Okay. Hose on the bottom versus hose on the top, right? And so if the CPU is installed here and you put hoses on the top, then the concern was that you were gonna be pulling air into your the CPU block. Because assume that every, assume there's fluid in the whole system, but not filled to 100%. Assume it's filled to like 98, mm -hmm. 99% then you're gonna have an air bubble sub somewhere. Sure. So the concern was, well, if air rises, mm -hmm. then the air might rise up into here, and then the, the, it'll actually be being pulled into the, and then goes into, and you don't, you don't want air in here. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest concern. The other issue is you never wanna do some kind of weird build like this, because now the air is definitely gonna be in here, right? And there are some builds where the radiator goes on the bottom, and so this, that's the problem. So mm -hmm. now you got air up in here, right? But, so then you can go tubes down, but there's so many people that got confused, being like, you got your tubes in the wrong spot, and it's about this. It's much simpler to explain than that. All you need to know is that air rises to the top. Where's the air? If it, it doesn't matter that this is going up right. if the air never entered in the first exactly. place. Exactly. It's like a siphon. So where's the air gonna be in this setup? Right, but where's it gonna be pulling the water from? Down there, which means it's gonna be sucking water, not yeah. air, because water's more Even dense. Even if it's going up from here. Exactly. Yeah, so this it. is what you want. Or, I mean, you can do different things. This is what I do, and it works. Sometimes you have a hose length problem, though, and then maybe you gotta go to the top, which then, it's not gonna really change your performance, it just maybe you have a shorter lifespan on your cooler. There's probably, but there's, the design of this has to have some sort of, it has to have that in consideration. Yes. But you don't wanna put the load on it. Exactly. In his testing he found that like, they make gurgling sounds sooner, or they may be a little bit sure. noisier. And then this works too, because the air is obviously gonna be like at the very top of the radiator, right? Got it. So if I'd like to do a front one, this is the ideal thing, if the hoses reach. So, if we go hoses down, What's our reach like? Insufficient? Yeah, that's not gonna reach, is it? Uh, no. No, okay. So we're either gonna have to go hoses up, or we're gonna have to go top mount. And I think for me, I'd honestly rather just go hoses up, and I don't care. So that'd be my only complaint so far about the cooler, is uh, make longer hoses. 
put all the fans on the wrong side somehow. Oh, because we were going to install it on the downward, remember? So then we flipped it, all the fans. <laughs> Wait, but it, does that matter? Yeah, it's terrible looking. So we got to do it all again. I'm going to call that a coaching error. That one was on you. So now we're going to install the power supply and uh, mainframe, Asus arranged for mainframe to send over these custom Gerald and Dunn purple cables. So this is the first time I've ever actually worked with custom power supply cables before. I always just use the default ones that come with the power supply. Mm -hmm. But we're going to connect to the power supply first. Sure. So yeah, mainframe perfectly designed it for this particular computer. They would have made one more purple one of these that eliminates into a four pin. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to feed this in. So here's the funny thing. I obviously really love building computers. Are you having fun? Yeah. Okay. I just zoned out completely that we were even filming a video, and we just—I felt like you did too. And we we're just like, "What do you want to do with that <laughs> yeah. one? You want to feed yeah, around like here? Behind, what do you do?" Like, and then right. I, I don't know how long it's like been like 40 minutes, and I don't even know if we've even done like a bit at the camera yeah. in the last 40 minutes. So we installed the power supply. Ran. I think we mentioned that I got custom cables from Mainframe. So we installed those, and we were just. I don't know, I just kind of like went into the <laughs> tank. And then we're kind of at the cable management side of things, but we can definitely plug the GPU in. So this is the, what is this? This okay. is the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3090. And it's the Asus ROG Strix. The sound here is going to be really weird because this is a metal surface directly below the bikes. Right. So, blah, blah, blah. so we've got it all built and we did the cable management. We haven't tested it yet, turned it on, but uh, I think it looks pretty good. What do you think of the purple? I think it's nice. Yeah, I think it works well with the black, a little bit of... Uh, the gray looks good with it too, right? Yeah, exactly. Whatever they call this. Compared to other motherboards I've seen and worked with, I didn't find the labeling on the board itself to be particularly great. Even with a flashlight looking under some of the headers and stuff, it's like you couldn't really make it out. I feel like if that's a little tip, I think Asus for this board could use contrastier, slightly larger, slightly more obvious labeling for some of the ports and stuff. <coughs> So to see if it posts, uh, I'm going to test it on this. This is Asus sent this over too. This is the, as you can see, the 32 UCG, which is their like 4K 120 HDR. It's every, it's literally everything you can have in a monitor. Uh, and I haven't tested it yet, so we're going to use it to see if the computer posts. Oh, holy! You would not expect that to be that heavy. It's like a weight. <laughs> I guess it probably it actually is. has a yeah. weight in it. <laughs> It also clearly has some kind of coating on it because the grid is being like diffused. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool. Do it. The lights are still blinking in there, so I think it sometimes the first boot takes a minute. We've reached the denial stage of dealing with grief. So that was a weird jump cut. But while you're here, let me tell you about today's sponsor, Storyblocks. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you could really use some footage, but shooting yourself would either be budgetarily or logistically unfeasible? Well, Storyblocks has you covered with an impressive collection of stock footage covering a wide range of subjects with unlimited downloads and 4K video. They're also amply supplied with backgrounds, overlays, and After Effects templates, and the interface is easy to use and navigate, and the clips are royalty-free for both personal and commercial use, so you can use them as much as you want, wherever you want. So if you think you could take advantage of a fantastic library of quality stock footage and effects, check out Storyblocks using the link in the description below. Okay, it's some time later, I don't exactly know, but probably a couple weeks now. And I figured out what the problem was quite a while ago, but I just wanted to keep working with it. So the issue that I was having where it seemed like I couldn't post, it had nothing to do with the computer, because it takes this monitor a really long time to, like, I don't know, HDMI handshake, initialize, boot up, just get the monitor launched, and in that time, the computer had already cycled through its post screen or, you know, went to some sort of failure screen and we never got to see anything. And so to give you a little example of that, I'll show you how long it takes. What I'll do is actually restart this computer while you're watching. And it'll give you an idea of how long it takes the monitor to boot up and you can imagine where we were in the post process trying to enter the BIOS. Now when the keyboard turns purple, you'll know that it's posted and then we'll see how long it takes for the monitor to kick in from there. So, there. Now, the computer's on. Let's see how long it takes for the screen to kick in. Now, I spoke to Asus about this, and they said that this is normal, actually, for this panel, due to the complexity of the scaler and the number of inputs, as well as initialization of the backlight, and that it will be noticeably slower when compared to simpler monitors that have simpler scalers and stuff like that. But as you can see, it takes quite a long time. And this is what made me think that there was something wrong with the build, because this is all I was seeing. So there. 
And then one more that I found to be pretty annoying is this. The cable that they give you for, uh, it's the upstream cable from your computer, so you connect the USB-A end to your computer and then the USB-C end to the monitor, and this sort of activates your USB outputs on the monitor. This cable is way too short. Now luckily, it also came with a Thunderbolt 4 cable, and you can connect the monitor uh, with Thunderbolt 4, even if you're not using the display, I'm using HDMI, but the Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt 4 can be used as a upstream as well, and so now I can, you know, connect my devices that way, and that Thunderbolt cable is plenty long, which is great, but this little upstream cable, it, it doesn't even reach from the monitor to my computer down there. Once you get it up and running, and once it's done initializing, the image quality coming out of this thing is outstanding. Not only does it have the lowest delta E for color accuracy I've ever scored, I think I got like a .3, which is sort of the, the you know the difference between perfect and where your color's coming in. That was incredible. And it comes with its own, it's an X-ray calibrator with like Asus branding on it, but it comes with a calibrator that I have the original one of those and it works exactly the same, calibrated perfectly. It's so good. The editing experience on this display has been just fantastic. I've also played some games on it. Being able to play 4K 120 with a 3090, you know, it, it the the experience is, is Tremendous and so all my complaints are like ergonomically, but the image quality I have no qualms with okay Let's move on to the computer. All right computer is up and running here on the desk. Let me just put a little light inside here so we can See it. Okay, first of all you'll notice this pretty cool thing where I've got my little gif running in loop on the cooler there which is cool and it worked well and I'm, I, I think it's neat, you know, you know, I'm not, I'm not really one for RGB, I've said that multiple times, but if you've got a cooler like that, it's cool that you can put your branding on it. However, I do have a complaint about the process for that. So in order to get this to work, it installed so many services and things that started up when Windows started up, and I even tried disabling them, like half of them or one at a time, and I couldn't even find which ones I could disable that wouldn't stop that from working. It kind of seemed like you needed all 15 of them in order to get this thing to work. So that's kind of annoying. You also needed, of course, to set it up, but it would be nice if you could set it up and then uninstall the software that you didn't want anymore. Uh, this, the, the software, th this Asus program, is kind of cool that it lets you, you know, keep your drivers up to date and that kind of thing, but it's just a bit too much. A few too many, like I said, services and startup applications. I wish they could maybe reel that in a little bit. As far as the cooler performance, it's working quite well. In that program, you can also set custom fan curves and that kind of thing, but even if you don't, you just leave it on the default it did really well with the overclocking, managing noise and performance. So the cooler is good. It's just unfortunate to fully take advantage of the screen. You have to, like I said, install that crazy software. But if you don't care what's on the display, don't install it. And I think you'll be happy with the cooler performance just at stock settings. Jumping back to the GPU real quick, it's been fantastic. It's outperformed both the Founders Edition and the previous GPU that I put in the, the gaming OC one that I put in my last build. Small amounts, obviously, they're all 3090s, but this is the best performing 3090 that I've used. Maybe I'll just put the benchmarks on the screen while I'm talking to you right now. I'm not gonna make a bunch of graphs because I don't feel like it. Basically, I got about a two to th two to three percent, I think it was a two percent on average, performance increase across pretty much all the tests without an increase in power consumption or noise or whatever. So that's great. Just two percent better performance using this hardware. And except for the 5950X in multi-threader performance, that's obviously, you know, like way faster than the 5900X because it's got more cores and everything. In terms of the overclock, I was able to get, it depends, I'm running it, you know, with the PBO2, so it depends on what you're doing. In certain multi-threaded tasks, it'll run anywhere from 4.4 to 4.6 gigahertz, and then in single-threaded, anywhere from 4.7 to 5 gigahertz, depending on the load. I would say I average around 4.5 and 4.8 for uh, multi-threaded and single, respectively. But yeah, you get a much better score for multi-threaded Cinebench than you do compared to the 5900X. So overall, I still think the 5900X is the better value choice for most tasks and applications. But I'm really happy I got to try the 5950X, so thanks to Asus for sending that over. And also, thanks for sending over all the ProArt stuff, because I was very interested in that. And as expected, it's excellent, you know, from the monitor's quality, motherboard, and I'm really curious to see where else they take this line, because I'm really liking what they're doing with this ProArt series.